<clears throat> so I apologize again for our late start, but maybe we could get started now. <clears throat> I'm Sam Thernstrom, the Executive Director of the Energy Innovation Reform Project, and thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank Paul Saunders, the Execu Executive Director here at the Center for the National Interest, for hosting us today. And Paul is also a member of my board of directors, for which I'm very grateful. <laughs> Um, and, and Sam is a senior fellow here, and, for which we're very grateful. Yes, exactly. Um, so I thought I would start by just saying that, uh, you know, we do two different types of events here, uh, typically. One is when in, in moments of hubris, I think we have answers that we want to share with all of you. <laughs> and the other is uh, in moments of humility when I think we have questions. And today is more the latter. We have interesting questions about an interesting topic, and we have an excellent panel to discuss them. I certainly have. Um, an intellectual bent on these questions, but I wouldn't say I feel like I know uh, at the end of the day what I think about these or what the answers are. So I hope today's conversation will be um, a, a useful dialogue about thorny questions. Um, the Energy Innovation Reform Project was established about five years ago to work on technology innovation policy, on, on uh, ways in which technology policy can improve the affordability, reliability, safety, and security of American energy supplies and our energy economy. I focus on innovation because I think innovation is an, uh, a way of changing the options that we have in the public policy space. Uh, issues of non-proliferation, our topic today, are typically thought of as uh, falling squarely within the foreign policy and diplomacy realm, and certainly they do, but I think it's important to remember that technology innovation can fundamentally influence the shape of the playing field uh, for these issues and maybe create potential solutions that diplomacy alone cannot. Uh, this is a, a big focus of EIRP uh, uh, in the nuclear space. We, we recently released a report that I'll just give a little plug for, what will advance nuclear uh, power plants cost? So uh, we, we believe that uh, innovation in the nuclear energy space has an opportunity to fundamentally address the core concerns of existing nuclear technologies, and so we are strong proponents of policies that will help us move towards an uh, innovative nuclear future. Um, and here at the center, obviously, there's a strong focus on realistic uh, perspectives on our foreign policy challenges, and I think this issue uh, very much demands that. Um, so today we want to talk about the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty and developments in nuclear energy technology and governance that are related to it. Um, the NPT is, I think, unusual in uh, the diplomacy space in embracing goals that are potentially with intention, in tension with each other. Uh, the NPT aspires to, at the same time, prevent the sp spread of nuclear weapons, advance the cause of disarmament, and simultaneously promote the peaceful use of nuclear technologies. Now, in theory, of course, all three of these goals could be compatible. Uh, in practice, yeah, I think it is difficult to say that the NPT has actually succeeded in harmonizing the pursuit of these um, or that it will be sufficient in, uh, to do so in the future. Certainly to give it its due, the UN notes that the NPT is the most ratified arms limitation and disarmament treaty in history, uh, which it touts as a testament to the treaty's significance, and I, I think that is worth acknowledging. Um, however, it's also important to focus on that we have clear examples of, first of all, uh, proliferation from non-signatory states such as India and Pakistan. We have the example of Iran working within the NPT framework and still making obviously very significant progress towards proliferation. Uh, and finally, we have the example of North Korea, which simply withdrew from the framework in 2003 when the extent of its nuclear program started to become evident. Given these facts, I think it's difficult to conclude that the NPT is successfully preventing proliferation, although obviously the counterfactual is unknown. Um, and uh, certainly on the NPT's second goal of promoting disarmament, uh, you know, we can see that there's been some reduction in warheads since the Cold, Cold War era, but certainly I would say no progress towards disarmament today. In fact, you know, if anything, we have some talk of modernizing weapon stockpiles. Similarly, we have to question today whether the NPT has really helped promote the peaceful use of nuclear energy technologies, and specifically, our concern here, the peaceful use of American nuclear technologies and services in global markets. Advocates of the treaty value it as a means of reducing risk, and I, and I certainly think, again, that we should acknowledge that, 
um, however imperfectly. Um, but realism certainly demands that we consider trade-offs in these policy outcomes. For instance, if the NPT impedes access of U.S. innovators to global markets, and certainly some people believe it is doing that, uh, and in doing that drives customers for new nuclear technologies into the arms of our global competitors, there are clearly risks to that approach. And I, and I want to emphasize that. I believe this really is a potentially life and death issue for the U.S. nuclear industry. If it can't go global, the industry really is not going to survive in this country, given that electric demand in the U.S. is expected to remain relatively flat in the near future uh, or even in the medium term. Uh, and that for a variety of policy and economic reasons, the prospects for building new nuclear reactors in this country, especially in large numbers, are relatively poor. Survival of the U.S. nuclear industry and an extension of our now aging human capital in that space will almost certainly depend, therefore, on access to global markets. And so realism about risks, I think, demands that we consider the downsides of the scenario where we lose access to that market or, or where access dwindles. Obviously, the economic opportunity costs of that scenario are significant. Less visible, but perhaps more significant, is the potential negative implications for non-proliferation -prol concerns. Without market share, the U.S. role in nuclear governance and non-proliferation will inevitably diminish, as I think some of our panelists will have uh, thoughts on. So I think these developments do suggest that we need to think very carefully first about the American national commitment to its nuclear energy industry, and secondly, whether we can find a new contemporary framework for global nuclear cooperation. And again, our panelists will have, I think, important insights on that question. Um, what I would just emphasize before I turn it over to them is that while addressing legitimate proliferation concerns, I think it's crucial that such a framework should endorse the inherently safe and relatively proliferation resistant nature of many of the generation four nuclear reactor technologies. And I have to say, when I was thinking about this event, the thought that I kept coming back to is the irony of the dynamic in which many of our regulatory and diplomatic processes that were designed to manage the risks of generation three reactor technologies, conventional light water reactors, that is, um, may potentially serve as a barrier to the development of generation four reactor technologies and their commercialization in markets, um, which in fact provide potential technical solutions to many of the risks that we're concerned about with generation three. So this is a, a difficult dynamic that we need to work past. I think public policy can do a lot to help us move past those things. Um, and one particular topic that I hope we'll have some time to talk about today would be the issue of uh, reprocessing nuclear fuels using pyroprocessing as a means of eliminating nuclear waste and the questions of proliferation that come up with that. I think there is a strong potential for this technology, uh, but at the same time, clearly an understanding of the field that it can only be addressed through a multilateral approach. And again, I think that's a topic of great interest to our panelists. So we have an outstanding quartet here. I, I thought I would just um, quickly run through their bios for you all, and then we could just go through the, the, the um, presentations directly without me introducing each of them individually, if that's all right. Um, so our panelists will speak in the order in which they are seated, beginning here with Ambassador Laura Holgate, who is currently a senior fellow at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University. Uh, uh, Ambassador Holgate previously served as the U.S. Representative to the United Nations and to the International Atomic Energy Agency, and previously had uh, a number of very senior positions in the U.S. government at the uh, NSC, the Department of Energy, and the Department of Defense. And I'm particularly interested in hearing her remarks about virtuous cycles in the nuclear energy space and ways in which business and security uh, concerns can be integrated. To the ambassador's left is Ken Luongo, the president of the Partnership for Global Security, who has created and led a number of international coalitions on this space. I would particularly commend the Global Nexus Initiative report on these questions to all of you that was released earlier this year. I found it especially informative myself. To Ken's left is Jack Spencer, who is the vice president of the Heritage Foundation's Institute for Economic Freedom and Opportunity, where he oversees research on a range of topics. And in particular, uh, Jack has a strong interest in nuclear waste management issues, nuclear nonproliferation, and nuclear technology. And last but certainly not least, at the end we have Tristan Volpe, who is a non-resident fellow 
in the nuclear policy program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, previously worked at Lawrence Livermore, and has just taken up a uh, position as an assistant professor in the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. So thank you all for joining us. Again, I apologize for the relatively late start and the hiccups with our uh, catering this morning, and I look forward to a great conversation. Ambassador. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Sam and Paul and Irfan and all of you for uh, spending some of your morning uh, on a, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, the, uh, as, as the opening comments reference, the Nonproliferation Treaty uh, really has a purpose of breaking the link between nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, or maybe you could just say it's just about policing the boundaries um, between those two uh, technologies or the, the potential of one to become the other. Um, but I have to agree with, with a, one premise that was mentioned, which is that it's not the only tool. And uh, while I disagree with several of the things that you might have offered about the, the impact of the treaty, I don't, I don't disagree a bit with uh, the, the conclusions that you drew, is that we definitely do need a new framework uh, for global nuclear security cooperation, and one in which the U.S. Uh, nuclear industry can thrive. Um, the, uh, this morning, I thought I would talk about uh, two ways in which nuclear energy technologies intersect uh, with national security interests. One is avoiding the spread of nuclear weapons to state or non-state actors, and second is maintaining, an, maintaining a strong U.S. voice in the global nuclear uh, conversation on governance. Uh, national security is, as you pointed out, the work of governments, largely, um, and international organizations and the treaties that, that under, undergird them, but it is also requires the active participation and contributions of the private sector and industry actors to achieve efficient and enduring outcomes. Such cooperation should be embedded in the way that companies do business and in the way that a government engages with them in what I call a virtuous circle, in which doing the right thing from a security perspective is also rewarded in ways that business leaders recognize. Nuclear energy's connection to nuclear weapons, both through proliferation of dual-use technology and through diversion of weapons usable material make it a critical example of this concept. For too long, the nuclear energy business has looked at nuclear security as a burden, as a drain on the bottom line. How can we create nuclear energy systems in which doing right by security is also doing right by shareholders? How do we create, how do we make nuclear security good for business and make the nuclear business good for security? Nuclear energy security risks must be understood clearly. A light water reactor fueled by low enriched uranium by itself poses no proliferation risk. This is an advantage as we consider the growing demand for nuclear energy in the context of global economic development and reducing carbon emissions. The risks come from the inherently dual use nature of current fuel cycle technologies, enrichment and reprocessing. Fortunately, a very small number of such facilities can serve a widely distributed set of power plants around the world. Additional risks come from existing stocks of highly enriched uranium and plutonium, whether in small quantities such as at research reactors or in large civilian fuel cycle plants or in military programs. These materials call for special care and attention to prevent their theft or misuse. Looking to the future, fast breeder reactors fueled with highly enriched uranium and or generating plutonium could be additional sources of proliferation risk along with the fuel cycle facilities associated with these or other potential nuclear energy concepts. On the other hand, smaller and more flexible advanced reactors have the promise to bring energy solutions to new countries and new applications, but they also create new vulnerabilities if care is not taken in their design and deployment. Looking across this spectrum, nuclear industries have a powerful role to play in managing the risks from each of these elements of the nuclear fuel cycle, and national security actors have technology and insight to offer in pursuit of secure nuclear energy. We've already proven examples of aligning interests between, int between business and nuclear security. The U.S.-Russia highly enriched uranium purchase agreement, the U.S. assured fuel supply, and the IAEA low enriched uranium fuel bank, and the black box around European enrichment technologies used in the U.S.-based Urenco plant shall all show that business and nonproliferation goals need not compete with each other. Security measures can enhance the bottom line instead of draining it. Governments and industry need to work together to find additional ways in which good nonproliferation outcomes go hand in hand with good, good business outcomes. And one place to start in this joint effort is to consider the wish list for each piece of this puzzle. 
From a non-proliferation and, na and national and nuclear security perspective, there are several key goals. First of all, to secure highly enriched uranium and separated plutonium as if they are the weapons that they could become. Second, phasing out production, transport, and use of highly enriched uranium and separated plutonium in the commercial sector. Third, reducing stocks of weapons usable material. Fourth, limiting the spread of enrichment and reprocessing technologies. But if we stop there and look at those only in isolation, they can seem to create limits or burdens on the expansionist profit-driven nature of the nuclear industry. Industry has often looked at these goals as either a cost to be shifted to government or policies to be opposed or undermined. But we have seen from the examples above that this doesn't always have to be the case. The nuclear industry has its own wish list. Durable spent fuel solutions, reliable supplies of expertise, material, and financing, stable legal and regulatory environments, reasonable return on investment, government support in the form of exports, loan guarantees, and other policy decisions, and a level playing field with other energy sources. And we should be looking at ways to examine these two sets of goals to develop tools that bring them together. Governments have some tools at their disposal that can help shape the business environment towards these kinds of virtuous circles that would benefit both sides of the nuclear coin. But the, the, some examples include loan guarantees, other financing arrangements, access to federal assets such as land or technology, opportunities for international cooperation such as those created through one, two, three agreements, government purchasing power, taxes and tariffs, technology substitution, for example, Mali 99 production using accelerators, and trade advocacy. Business and non-government actors have tools at their disposal as well. Attractive, generating attractive technologies for export markets, sharing of best practices, for example, on, on, nucle on security, for example, through the World Institute for Nuclear Security, security and safeguards by design, codes of conduct, and industry-based nuclear security standards and certifications, you know, perhaps some kind of an ISO type standard to supplement uh, national regulations. Given the challenges of the Generation 3 and 3 plus reactors currently under construction, advanced reactors, Gen 4 and others, provide a unique chance to bake in virtuous cycles from the beginning. <clears throat> Since none of these reactors have been built yet, it is more possible than ever to apply security by design and safeguards by design to advanced reactor designs and their associated fuel cycles right from the start, which should, should reduce costs and increase efficiencies. These reactors, being smaller, cheaper, factory built, and in some cases having lifetime cores, are intended to be more attractive than larger gigawatt scale reactors on price, schedule, grid appropriateness, and fuel management grounds. If they live up to those expectations, advanced reactors could have the additional benefit of bringing the U.S. back to the front of the line for reactor exports. This restoration will not only have economic benefits, but it will also yield national security benefits by increasing interest among the nuclear newcomers in buying American instead of Chinese or Russian, and in signing the agreements for nuclear cooperation, or one, two, three agreements, that are required for access to U.S. nuclear technology and U.S. brand attributes of world-class safety and security performance. These agreements by law contain stricter nonproliferation and nuclear security provisions than what China or Russia requires, and therefore thereby wrap signatories into a web of commitments that reinforce the global nonproliferation regime and maintains a U.S. voice in global nuclear rules and norms. In this way, national security goals and nuclear commerce goals are aligned. Another tool to align security and commerce may be found in the creation of industry-based standards for nuclear security. While national regulations create a baseline of nuclear security compliance, we know that some operators have decided to make improvements beyond what the regulations require, based on judgments around corporate liability or local security risks. What if nuclear operators could work together to identify standards for nuclear security and safeguardability analogous to LEED building standards for nuclear, for, with, with gradations for good to better to best? When advertised, such recognition could enhance reputations and, and provide a deterrent to would-be thieves, but what if they could also be tied to financial benefits such as access to financing or variable insurance rates? If security is seen as intention, if security is seen in tension with profits, we will continue to be at risk from the kind of nonproliferation failures that Sam mentioned or that we've seen in the AQCon network or from the potential for theft, diversion, and misuse of nuclear technology or materials by states or, or terrorists. The most durable nuclear system is one that makes nuclear security good for business and business good for nuclear security. And I believe that the U.S. is best positioned to deliver this kind of system 
and that this, this conversation has the technology, experience, and commitment to make it happen. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Okay, thanks, <clears throat> thanks Sam, and uh, thanks to Paul and Irfan for the invitation to speak here today. I told Paul I last time I was here was in a different location, so it's been a <laughs> it's been it's been a while, but uh, it, that's my that's my mistake. Um, in you know, in in my view, the the context for evaluating the contribution and the value of nuclear power in the 21st century has uh, evolved significantly from the way it was viewed in the 20th century. But the evaluation framework hasn't caught up with that, um, with that evolution, hasn't been updated. The challenges that we face, the financing situation, the competition from other countries, the evolution of technology, the new markets, and frankly public expectations are all different today than they were at the close of the 20th century. And all of these issues are intertwined. So you need more than single issue siloed communities to tackle them. The, the way Washington tends to work is that people are expert in something and they stay in their hole and if you're outside their hole it's hard for them to understand. I don't think we have the luxury in this area of the future of nuclear power of being siloed anymore or being single issue communities. You can't just care about nuclear nonproliferation or the promotion of nuclear power or security or safety or the kilowatt hour price. You've got to care about all of these issues. And you have to be able to find a balance between addressing those challenges and then recognizing the continuing strategic and geopolitical importance of nuclear power and commerce for the United States. To effectively operate in this environment, I think you need three things, new policies, new partnerships, and the recognition of new realities. Let me just talk a bit about some of the new realities that I think impact the value of nuclear power in this century. First, I know we're not supposed to talk about this in Washington in the current environment, but climate, low carbon, and, uh, and emissions are major consideration. I mean, um, I, I think you can't look at the weather situation without having some inkling that things are not working as well as they should. So there is a demand, whether you're in Paris or you're out of Paris, there's a demand for low carbon energy. Cyber, artificial intelligence, and non-state actor threats. We've, atten we've really addressed one in non-state actor better than cyber. Artificial intelligence, I think, is something completely new. Aggressive state-backed international competitors, Russia and China inexperienced newcomer nations in dangerous neighborhoods. The market is not in the West. The market is in Asia, the market is in the Middle East, the market is in potentially in Africa. Major technological um, evolution, uh, Gen 4 advanced reactors that have been spoken about, that don't fit neatly into the current regulatory system which was designed for light water reactors. Then there are kind of softer things that I think are, are, are equally important. There's a clean air, public health, and sustainable economic development requirement in a developing world. Nobody wants to go to Beijing or to Delhi and not be able to breathe without a mask. New advanced um, reactor technology is something uh, from a security standpoint I think we really need to give a lot more thought to. And then this, this issue which is, arises often that I think is important but doesn't kind of make it into the top 10 list is the elimination of electricity inequality um, as power and reliability demands grow around the world. I mean, we still have, forget what it is, 1.3 billion people or something like that that don't have access to reliable electricity. So this session was described as a way to begin to navigate the tension between high U.S. standards for global nuclear trade, the nuclear market assault from Russia and China, and the importance of maintaining influence over projects and governance. In my view, high standards matter. I think they're really important. We can't afford a race to the bottom um, in pursuit of market share. I think that's the wrong way to go. But if we're going to be a beacon for high standards, we need to package it in a much more effective and strategic way that doesn't make it viewed as a punishment 
for doing the right thing. This is very similar to what Laura's point is. So let me just go through um, three issues and offer um, at the end a little uh, bit of my, uh, my view on how we guide the next generation of nuclear power. So let me start with nuclear security. Nuclear security is a, is a big issue and it's outgrown its traditional definition of guards, guns, and gates. The physical protection issues that generally people think about when they think about nuclear security are still important, but there are a number of new security challenges in this century, which we'll talk about in a second. The, the system for nuclear security is really not well structured. It is, stands in contrast both to the safeguard system, which is defined through the Nonproliferation Treaty, and nuclear safety, which is an international agreement that guides um, the Convention on Nuclear Safety, which guides uh, international nuclear safety. So the, the system for nuclear security on a global basis is it's not well integrated in my view. It's opaque uh, in terms of what countries are doing. There's no mandate for consistent standards and implementation across borders. And it's primarily based on very good recommendations from the International Atomic Energy Agency, but those recommendations can be implemented or they can be ignored. There's no mandate that they be implemented. This situation creates the opportunity for weak links to be created and perpetuated in the global nuclear system. In the past decade, we've had four nuclear security summits, very valuable. They have made a lot of progress in some areas, not all areas. One particular area was the elimination of fissile material stockpiles um, in a number of countries and, uh, and in, uh, in focusing attention on the nuclear security issue. But, I, you know, in, in the environment that we currently exist in, I just don't think that that's enough. I think the nuclear security issue has morphed into something that's much more complex. And I just go through a, a short list of things that I think are new to the agenda, not necessarily new to the agenda, but I think new to the policy agenda. They're being dealt with at a certain level in the industry, uh, but, th but I think that there's, there's more that needs to be done. Cybersecurity, I was kind of alarmed. I had a conversation the other day with someone um, who said, you know, our antenna is really up about cyber. And this was a conversation with someone who previously had said from the industry side, we're not that worried about cyber. We think that the air gap is good enough. Um, but I, you know, this is a mutating challenge and I think that, uh, that the level of alarm is, is being um, elevated and and something that really worries me because digital infrastructure is something that's constantly under attack and I heard some statistic about the number of attacks per day on nuclear facilities and it, it was actually quite high, all rebuffed, but still, there's obvious probing. Non-state actor and, and terrorist challenges, a lot has been done since 9-11, but these are also um, creative people for de uh, destructive reasons. Um, so you have to be able to uh, adapt to their new challenges. Artificial intelligence is something that is emerging and is an in, uncharted, really, in the nuclear area. Um, this is robotics and a variety of other applications. I'm not a technology person, so I couldn't tell you all of the, all of the details. But two things I can tell you um, that concern me. One is this is not likely to be a purely benign technology, and second, this is not going to be controlled by states. In fact, in the West, artificial intelligence is generally controlled by the corporate sector. So, um, and there's, there's no oversight system, uh, global oversight system for this. A lurking issue, which may be, you know, you may consider to be a little bit off topic, but which I'm, I'm worried about kind of in an existential sense, is the potential for geoengineering as a response to climate change. Uh, the decline in the existing nuclear reactor fleet and the uncertain future of next generation reactor technologies is going to impact zero carbon energy production. If there's a country that considers climate change to be a threat to their national security, to their food supply, and they start to act on geoengineering to try to protect um, their national interest, you know, there's a lots of unpredictability associated with that and we've done a little bit of research on what the international system for managing um, geo uh, engineering is and you know there's some academic institutions but there's not much that's going on uh, beyond that. 
Uh, and then finally, you know, the next phase of nuclear power is going to be in volatile regions where the United States may not have as much influence as it had in the past. Uh, and if the U.S. is not the supplier and countries that are taking technology from other suppliers uh, consider in uranium enrichment and reprocessing to be in their national interest. I don't know that there's much, if it's not U.S. content in there, uh, much that we'll be able to do about it. So I think there's considerable work to be done on what I'm calling nuclear security 3.0 that's very different from the analyses and considerations that sprung up after 9-11. And I don't think that we're acting on this in a strategic manner, either at the governmental level or at the key player level. So let me turn briefly to, um, to uh, geopolitics. Uh, nuclear power is growing in a developing world, particularly North and South East Asia, in Middle East, in Africa. In fact, I think Northeast Asia is going to be the region of the world with the largest thicket of nuclear technology in the world as the decline of existing reactors in the West continues through mid-century. Uh, and in many of those countries, there's an educational, regulatory, and training gap. I would say that they need to be significantly strengthened in that area, and we need to collectively ensure that these nuclear newcomers are well prepared for, to safely and securely operate their nuclear infrastructure. But the question is, who is the we? Okay? This is a question that's rising in importance because um, we need to know who's going to supply the next wave of light water reactors and who's going to supply the next level of reactor, advanced reactors, and whether or not they're going to support the highest levels of, of nuclear governance. The traditional suppliers, including the United States and its allies, have primarily written the current rules, but they're in the process of losing ground to Russia and soon to China. Uh, these states and their nuclear ambitions are very different from the way the United States is thinking about this question, in my opinion. They're looking at nuclear as part of their geostrategic outreach to the rest of the world and how it fits in with their overall objectives. Um, this is a serious issue because nuclear operation and uh, supply are special responsibilities, in part because radiation doesn't respect borders, but from a business standpoint, because Three Mile Island and Chernobyl and Fukushima were real body blows to the nuclear industry and also to the branding of nuclear energy as something valuable for humanity. And I worry that if we have dominance of Russia and China and we have another accident or a terrorist incident, that that will be the, the death knell for this industry. And I, that's why I think standards matter. That's why I think a race to the bottom isn't a good idea. Uh, just a little bit on, on Russia and China. Um, Russia's aggressively marketing its technology through this build, own, operate, return of spent fuel. It's extremely attractive. I mean, who would not want that? You're basically absolved of responsibility. Um, but it's only possible because of state financing. No private company can afford to offer what the Russians are offering, as evidenced by the fact that no private company is offering what the Russians are offering. And they can't compete with that kind of an offer. Whether the Russians can financially sustain it remains to be seen, but it is something which is, is really tilted the playing field. Interestingly, though, um, what I, from what I've heard anecdotally in conversations that people have had with countries that are dealing with the Russians, they would much prefer to deal with the United States for, for the reasons that Laura laid out, both from a technological standpoint, from a safety standpoint, from a regulatory gold, gold standard. Um, but we are having significant problems closing 123 agreements uh, and our export industry is ailing. China, in my view, is poised to become the Amazon.com of the nuclear industry in this century. By 2026, they're projected to take over, uh, overtake the United States as the world's top nuclear power generating nation, making it the global uh, leader in operation and market, but also initially at least the leading nuclear nation with the least cumulative years of experience compared to other major nuclear nations. It's got 20 reactors under construction, 40 more planned, 
and it's seeking to build plants in emerging um, economy nations as well as longstanding um, nuclear states. Uh, it's also working very hard on advanced reactor concepts and it might have the first out of the box advanced reactor. Uh, the third nuclear actor, uh, nuclear export actor is South Korea, um, which is in, has emerged as an important supplier, particularly for the Middle East, but it seems to be in a state of confusion, both about its domestic program as well as its export. Uh, and I think that that has significant um, implications because they're the export nation that's closest to the United States. So, in the face of these realities, in my view, the U.S. is not facing a choice of whether to lead or follow as it relates to nuclear exports. Its choice is to lead or to cede, as in cede the playing field to the Russians and the Chinese. If the U.S. does not rapidly and actively reinvigorate its global civil nuclear strategy and become a stronger player in the export market, it will be left, however, with the responsibility and the bill for managing untoward consequences. So let me just offer three examples of where nuclear nations that the United States did not supply ended up giving us an enormous bill. Iraq, North Korea, and Iran. Okay? We didn't supply them, but we have, we're dealing with the mess. So I do think it makes sense to think about whether or not having the United States as a supplier can mitigate those kinds of consequences. Part of the answer to this situation is that there, there really needs to be much better strategic thinking and leadership at the federal level. I, I, am, the, I am kind of stunned at the fact that our, at the moment, we have outsourced a significant component of our civil nuclear strategy to state legislatures and governors. I have the utmost respect for state capitals, but as a general rule, they're not rife with strategic thinkers. Okay? They're interested in jobs, they're interested in kilowatt hour price, they're interested in local issues. But if those reactors in states where they're teetering go down, it does have geopolitical implications for the United States. So there needs to be, I think, a clearer recognition of the significant implications for the country of continued technological superiority in the nuclear area and its corollary implications for the domestic economy, workforce, employment, environmental objectives, safety, security, and nonproliferation. I worry that there's a nuclear geopolitics gap between the United States and Russia and China. They're thinking strategically and we don't seem to be thinking strategically and the playing field is significantly tilted against U.S. companies. Just a, a brief word on governance. Uh, you know, in my view, effective governance is the fundamental foundation of public confidence in nuclear power. It is not an ideal environment that we live in at the moment, and I think it's essential that the United States continue to set the, the tone and scope for nuclear governance as it evolves. Um, and I also think if you're going to influence Russia and China, you have to do it from a position of strength, and that position of strength is not by being on the sidelines. So my final point, guiding the next generation of nuclear power. I think there's a silver lining in the current situation that we're facing, um, and that's because the, that parties, disparate parties, that care about things like climate and the future of nuclear power and American power geopolitically and nuclear security and governance are increasingly finding a way to work together. I've been calling this a break the mold partnership that can guide the next generation of nuclear power and is potentially very powerful. This partnership is based on the premise that no single entity has all the answers or controls all the levers that are necessary to advance progress. However, they have common interests that weren't obvious in the 20th century. And together they can assess the landscape and formulate balanced, realistic, and effective responses that serve climate, energy, and security objectives. My organization, in collaboration with the Nuclear Energy Institute, has helped to crack the old mold by creating the Global Nexus Initiative, which Sam referenced, and if this is our, the report, if you're interested in Russia, um, has some if, you're, if you want them. Uh, what that project is started as was looking at the intersection of climate change and nuclear power and global security, and it brought together a very diverse working group um, to do it. 
its impact has been surprising, in, in my opinion, because we started this really as a kind of risky um, proposition. It wasn't clear that it was going to work. But our final report was, uh, or at least the final report of the first phase, um, was endorsed by all of our diverse members, and it wasn't watered down. What it said is that there's an importance of nuclear power, uh, but there's also a need to strengthen governance. It said there's rising importance in nuclear geopolitics, and it's important that we have partnerships with non-traditional allies. Um, we intend to continue to, to build on this um, over the, in the next phase, over the next two years. In my view, this Break the Mold partnership, as a function of its diversity, can serve as a credible voice on complex nuclear issues, generate high-level attention to challenges, and provide a platform crea for creative and effective problem solving, and it is what's needed to guide the next phase of nuclear power in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Sam, first, I got to apologize. You said in the opening we were here to, to ask questions. I only brought answers. So. Thank God. Um, <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, look, there are a lot of reactors out there. There are 99 operating here in the United States. We have a couple under construction. We have a couple that are partially under construction and might be under construction again. 14 planned, 21 proposed, lots of potential. In the world, there's 147 reactors operating, 56 under construction, 160 planned, 351 proposed. So look, I know we stopped using the, word, the, the phrase nuclear renaissance a long time ago, rightly so, but we still may be at the precipice of a nuclear renaissance. There could be a lot of nuclear reactors being built in the near future. Um, and it's, to me, it's not because of CO2, it's because of all the other good things that nuclear um, brings to bear independent of CO2. So the question before us is what should the United States and other countries do to manage this potential growth so that we, the people, can enjoy the benefits of nuclear power without increasing the risks of proliferation? To this end, we ask ourselves, I guess I do have a question, is the non-proliferation treaty obsolete? Well, the quick answer is no more or no less than it was on March 5th, 1970, the day it came into force. But I still have lots of time, so let's dig a little bit deeper. Um, the NPT does not exist in a vacuum. It's part, perhaps even the cornerstone, of a larger non-proliferation regime as a whole. I would suggest the non-proliferation regime is certainly under stress, but not broken. Indeed, it's lar largely working if properly understood. The treaties, agreements, organizations, and initiatives currently in place today provide peaceful nations with numerous tools to impact the spread of dangerous technologies and the authority to act when dangerous behavior is identified. The question is whether supplier states follow those established rules and to what extent peaceful nations are willing to actually compel proliferators to discontinue risky activities. North Korea, for example, didn't surprise anyone in the early 1990s when its so-called peaceful program uh, turned out to be not so peaceful. To the extent there were any surprises, the international community had plenty of time to respond. And what more can we ask out of a non-proliferation regime? Whether changes in policy ultimately, ultimately altered North Korea's behavior can be debated, but certainly the non-proliferation regime worked insofar as it gave the world ample warning to North Korea's intentions. Same is true today with Iran. The world's not aware, unaware of Iran's programs, and it has, never has been. The problem is with states that enable Iran's actions and the difficulty of developing cohesive policy to compel changes in its behavior. Now sure, one could argue that North Korea and Iran represent failures of the non-proliferation regime. And to the extent that the purpose of the non-proliferation regime is to prevent any spread of technology for the purposes of we weaponization, that might be true. But the reality is that as long as the basic building block of the international system is the sovereign state, no international treaty or regime can stop a state from pursuing dangerous programs. It's not a problem of non-proliferation policy, but a problem of hostile, dangerous regimes. That's not to say that the current regime could not be modified. I would argue that the fundamental bargain of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, though, is sound that a nation is free to pursue peaceful nuclear purposes if it agrees to reject militarizing that, uh, that technology. But that being said, the growth of nuclear power does present new and unique challenges. Most of, most of these challenges, those of you who have heard me or know me won't be surprised that I'm about to say this, are the result of states being too closely 
uh, involved with commercial nuclear activities. But if met appropriately, I believe that the global nuclear renaissance, if that's what it becomes, is not incompatible with non-proliferation objectives. So how do we achieve this? Well, first we need to build a nuclear industry on strong economics with clear lines of liability. This includes financial liability. So I disagree with some of this talk about we need more loan guarantees and things like that. We need clear uh, liability for waste management. I believe that one of the primary problems of the U.S. nuclear industry is the disconnect between waste management responsibility and waste management uh, in the production of nuclear waste. And accident liability. Yes, Price-Anderson. Now, I'm not for getting rid of Price-Anderson tomorrow, but we need to look to a future where we don't rely on Price-Anderson. Continuing, continuing to rely on government for these things creates massive business distortions, creates obstacles to innovation, warps the economics, and diverts the government's attention from what it should be doing, which is stopping the bad guys. It also creates a shroud of non-peaceful diversion of commercial nuclear activities. An independent nuclear sector built on sound economics, responsible for all aspects of its operations, and exposed to the very bright light of the free market would have absolutely no incentive to divert its operations to military or non-peaceful activities. And the fact is, if the sector can exist absent government support, then maybe now is not the time for nuclear energy. Now let me be very clear. I think that nuclear can be successful. When I look at the times that nuclear energy is subject to the marketplace, it does very well. So I'm a nuclear, I, I believe strongly in nuclear energy. That's why I do what I do. Um, second, we need to use what leverage we have to influence the global nuclear industry, we the United States. It's no secret that U.S. companies' participation in the global nuclear commercial business has declined substantially over decades. What was once dominated by the U.S. is now largely the realm of the Russians, Koreans, French, we know the list, maybe the Chinese, maybe the Indians, probably at some point, again, the Japanese. The fact is that no U.S. company could ever produce another nuclear component and these other countries would fully meet the demand of the commercial nuclear industry. So even if there were a nuclear renaissance, and even if it came at the expense of nonproliferation objectives, the tools at America's disposal are limited. That said, we have three very powerful tools. One's R&D, two is our prestige, and three is expert, we, our expertise, the industry's expertise in operations. Luckily, these th three things are precisely what's needed to ensure that the global growth of nuclear power moves forward without unduly jeopardizing the nation's nonproliferation objectives. America's research and development will be critical to the future of safe reactors, proliferation-resistant fuels, and new methods for managing nuclear waste. Exporting these technologies are key. And look, we are the United States. By virtue of nothing more than that, we will have influence over these activities or those activities that we determine are of national import. And if nonproliferation is one of them, we'll have that influence. But it's not just that. Our one, two, threes give us leverage. We're a massive economy. And the bottom line is that it's in most nations' best interest to work with us. So that prestige is real. And America's nuclear plants operate extraordinarily efficiently and safely. This expertise is extremely important to new and old nuclear nations. By exporting this knowledge, fewer reactors will be needed and the sector's economics will be better off more, more likely. The same is true of safety. America's safety culture, America, America's nuclear industry safety culture, should be the cornerstone of every nation's commercial nuclear program. The fact is, if every nation's nuclear industry was like ours, there would be no, non, there would be no proliferation problem or threat. Third, we need to commit to developing new rules to govern commercial nuclear activities broadly. We need to encourage, including ourselves, other nations to build industries based on American ideals like free markets, transparency, and openness. Supplier states should open their markets to full competition. Companies, including state-owned ones, well, they should not be state-owned, but even if they are, should agree to operate as private for-profit firm, as private for-profit firms. And we need to eliminate quotas, tariffs, and other market-distorting policies. We need to ink one, two, three agreements that respect proliferation concerns without unduly sacrificing commercial nuclear activity. By recognizing that the state of nuclear technology 
by recognizing the true state of nuclear technology and its general availability. Absent this balance, the U.S. risks diminishing its influence over international nuclear trade policy by isolating itself further than necessary from global, the global nuclear market. And finally, the U.S. should reiterate its support of the enduring role of Article 4 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. The reality is that any country can pursue whatever technology that it chooses. As the article states, a country's right to pursue nuclear technologies are inalienable. The inalienability of this right, however, is not absolute in the context of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. It's contingent on fulfilling their obligations and responsibilities under the pact. Any non-proliferation regime that does not respect the rights of individual states will ultimately fail. The key is to devise a system that promotes buy-in from both suppliers and consumers of commercial nuclear services. If the system is economically irrational, credible and reliable, then peaceful nuclear countries should find participation beneficial. Only those that would seek to use nuclear technology for nefarious purposes would find benefit benefits from operating from outside the system. This would allow us to focus on those countries rather than peaceful ones. In conclusion, the current non-proliferation regime provides the international community with the tools to control the spread of dangerous nuclear materials. However, none of these tools can magically prevent a dedicated nation or other international or national actor, for that matter, from seeking threatening capabilities. This is not a non-proliferation problem or a commercial nuclear problem but a hostile actor problem. Preventing hostile regimes from acquiring nuclear capabilities requires the political will to use the available tools effectively. Furthermore, there will always be a struggle to keep technology of all sorts out of the hands of those who would misuse it. This struggle, however, is not justification to deny society the benefits of crit critical technology such as nuclear power. And that's what I got. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Excellent. First, let me just say that I think this has been a, a phenomenal panel that has brought together a number of different uh, perspectives. And so this morning, what I'm going to do to try and wrap up is bring more of a strategic perspective to try and integrate some of these viewpoints, in particular by trying to take stock of U.S. efforts uh, to inhibit the spread of sensitive nuclear technology. Now, typically, uh, when we think of nuclear proliferation, as Jack just mentioned, we think of the bad regimes. Uh, we think of Iran or North Korea. Uh, but I think we're entering a rather unique period right now. Now, beyond Iran, uh, there are no other adversaries of the United States uh, with potential nuclear aspirations that don't already have an operational nuclear capability, such as North Korea. Instead, there's a small number of U.S. allies and partners uh, that might want to build up or acquire enrichment or processing capabilities, sensitive ENR technology for short. Now, while ENR technology, as we've uh, discussed uh, earlier today, has very legitimate applications, of course, in civil nuclear energy programs. Um, it's also the critical technology used to produce the exotic fissile material that fuels the core of a nuclear explosive device. Now, the longstanding problem from a global uh, governance perspective is that there's really no prohibition on developing ENR technology under the terms of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, so long as a country permits international monitoring to ensure peaceful use. Now, the United States has therefore pursued a number of additional measures over many decades to try and dissuade even our closest allies and partners from surmounting this critical technical choke point to the bomb. Uh, indeed, the last two U.S. Uh, administrations uh, both uh, pursued uh, a number of new uh, initiatives to try and put in place new controls to limit the spread of ENR technology. Yet, we, are, we still see a handful of U.S. allies uh, in Northeast Asia in the Middle East uh, that have refused to foreclose the option to develop ENR facilities uh, for energy programs. The challenge is how we go about responding. Uh, to state the obvious, uh, we can't apply the same sort of counterproliferation instruments uh, we wielded against a country like Iran or North Korea before that. Now, let me give you a vivid example uh, of when this has actually happened uh, recently. Back in the summer of 2015, Saudi Arabia repeatedly uh, threatened to develop an enrichment program. Uh, now, this gambit was designed to try and put pressure on the White House, in part, for two concessions. First, they wanted uh, greater uh, conventional uh, weapon transfers, uh, notably the F-35, and they also asked for a formal defense treaty, both of which were not on the table at all. Now, the conventional wisdom says that the U.S. should just ignore uh, these sort of nuclear musings, especially from a country like Saudi Arabia uh, that had almost no nuclear infrastructure at all at the time. Um, if it turns out later that the Saudis were serious, not just bluffing to try and gain leverage, 
the U.S. can always just turn up the pressure and dissuade further progress towards an enrichment capability, in part by cutting off technology, making it harder to find a supplier, uh, and applying costs, making it more difficult for them to move down that road. Uh, but also by, by incentivizing them uh, to try and change course. Now, these are the three traditional levers of U.S. nonproliferation policy, technology denial, coercion, and inducements. And they've been mixed together uh, to produce really effective results in the past, especially when it comes to U.S. allies. But this morning, I'm going to argue that we may need to rethink the conventional wisdom and refocus U.S. efforts around inducements rather than denial or coercion towards allies for three reasons. Now, first, for a number of reasons that we've heard this morning, the practical utility of technology denial and coercion towards U.S. allies is in serious decline today. Why is that? Now, these tools have worked quite well in the past when there were few suppliers of nuclear technology and the U.S. nuclear industry had a dominant share of the global market. Uh, these conditions made it possible for the U.S. to pressure other supplier states into limiting the export of, e of ENR technology or to wield our considerable influence to set very high nonproliferation safety standards, topics we've discussed uh, this morning. Um, now, we've also established multinational uh, control regimes, such as the Nuclear Suppliers Group. group. Now, and these controls and pressure obviously came at a cost uh, in terms of lost business opportunities and strained political relations uh, at times, but there was also clear nonproliferation uh, benefits uh, that we were able to reap. Now, unfortunately, uh, there are some key trends that are converging to make controls and pressure less effective today. Foremost, as we've discussed, the U.S. nuclear industry has suffered a serious decline over the last few decades, losing relative global market share uh, while atrophying key capabilities, such as our supply chain, our ability to make components. At the same time, uh, there's more and more vendors around the world that are eager to compete. We've, we have major players in Russia, France, and soon China are really willing to supply uh, technology, equipment, and fuel without the same sort of stringent conditions required by U.S. 123 nuclear cooperation agreements. We're still we're seeing new emerging technologies. We've talked about Gen 4 reactors, but I'll also highlight uh, advanced manufacturing technologies, specifically industrial 3D printing, uh, which may further expand the select group uh, of industrial vendors who have the capabilities needed to produce nuclear components for the, in for the global market. Now, Ambassador Holgate uh, highlighted some business strategies to try and offset this trend, and hopefully we can realize those. But I'll also note that we're seeing a rather odd trend uh, in countries such as Germany, South Korea, as, as was mentioned, uh, and Taiwan uh, and Japan. And that is that democratic electorates are expressing increasing dissatisf dissatisfaction with even civil nuclear energy programs. Germany is in the midst of a nuclear phase-out, and they're on track to eliminate all nuclear power plants. South Korea, I, I like that phrase, South Korea seems a bit confused about what direction it's going to be taking. Uh, but this phase-out of nuclear power uh, is quite surprising amongst some of the most advanced industrial nations in the world. And I think we need to uh, integrate that into this uh, kind of trend line going forward. Now, fortunately, let me be clear, there's no pending contracts that I know of for the construction of new ENR uh, facilities. But there's a growing number of supply options, and these are going to remain problematic in the years ahead. Now, furthermore, the threat of coercive uh, sanctions is really far less credible against an ally that develops this sort of technology in full compliance with the IAEA. Now, to be sure, the United States has become quite sophisticated at sanctioning adversarial regimes in North Korea or Iran for, devel for developing nefarious nuclear programs and effective at disrupting illicit nuclear supply networks. Now, these counterproliferation efforts should absolutely remain a central element of U.S. strategy to deter and deny the spread of nuclear weapons. Indeed, that's really my primary role now at the Naval Postgraduate School is to help U.S. Special Operations Command as they take on this new counterproliferation mi mi uh, mission set. But these sort of coercive instruments that I work with my students on, uh, on, on trying to, you know, uh, make sure that they're educated in the strategic landscape are simply neither credible nor prudent options to shape the trajectory of an allies nuclear program that's developed in full legal above board compliance with its international treaty obligations. This leads to my second main point. Uh, there's still one sharp tool in our nonproliferation toolbox when it comes to trying to shape the future, uh, and specifically the next generation of friendly our partner nuclear aspirants. The U.S. can shift towards a strategy of trying to buy out or incentivize allies uh, to give up their ENR ambitions. Now, there's ample historical precedent 
uh, for this policy refocus going back to the genesis of the MPT regime itself, which required a generous outlay of inducements from Washington to convince many of our allies to sign and ratify the treaty in the first place. Uh, but at other times, the promise of rewards from, from Washington um, has been insufficient to convince allies to trade away or at least constrain their quest for ENR technology. So this is the key question. When are nuclear inducements most effective towards U.S. allies? Um, I think the key is that we really need to move at the earliest possible sign of possible intent to develop these sort of facilities. This is really the key moment uh, when incentives can influence an ally's trajectory and decision calculus. Instead of investing considerable resources to reap a distant payoff down the road, uh, we can convince an ally to try and trade away its emerging aspirations for a package of inducements uh, that can provide more immediate benefits. Now, the development of these technologies is considerably expensive and can be quite risky from a security perspective. Overcoming some of the many scientific challenges associated with enrichment technology in particular requires sustained financial investment over a long period of time while potentially warding off regional security risks. Um, so at an early stage, some allies uh, may be willing to trade away a sensitive program for the right mix of security, energy, and economic rewards. Now, an inducement strategy is unlikely to succeed when an ally is already deeply vested in this sort of ENR technology. The crux of the problem is that it becomes much more expensive for Washington to buy out an operational enrichment facility uh, than unrealized blueprints and distant aspirations. Moreover, even some of the most lucrative investments that we could put on the table simply may not be sufficient once a country is already vested in a program uh, to, to really give up this, this sort of capability. Um, oftentimes, these sort of programs become really locked in, uh, and you see political veto players, invested institutional interests, making it really difficult for the central government to trade away nuclear fuel cycle projects. Um, we can talk in the Q&A uh, more about some specific examples, but I think Japan's experience uh, dealing with its uh, major plutonium uh, uh, reprocessing facility at Rakasho is quite, uh, you know, really illustrates some of these dynamics well. Um, in many ways, they became entrapped by local interest and were unable to really change course even after the 2011 uh, nuclear accidents. Now, I see some similar dynamics existing across the EC where South Korea's uh, desire to commercialize an experimental form of reprocessing highlights the risk that these sort of dynamics can set in uh, at an early research and development stage as well. Um, now, this obviously creates a significant barrier, I think, to President Moon's recently announced plan to phase down nuclear energy in the country. So if the U.S. can decide to put lucrative rewards on the table at an early stage of development, uh, the odds are, are, I think, solid that an ally might firmly close the door on ENR technology. So what does this actually look like in practice? Uh, quite simply, I think the pledge that we get in return for offering uh, incentives needs to be relatively immune to changing geopolitical and do domestic conditions. Countries don't necessarily need to replicate the UAE gold standard, uh, but there are other options beyond legal forfeiture uh, that can really close the door on ENR uh, technology without running into some of the contentious Article 4 issues in the MPT. Now, I'd be happy to discuss what some of these hand tying mechanisms uh, might look like in the subsequent discussion, but I just want to conclude with my third point, which is that I think there are, to be clear, a host of non trivial issues to consider for this uh, preferred approach that I'm putting out today. But I think many of these are manageable within the current U.S. alliance architecture. Um, one of the most challenging aspects, I think, to this strategy is trying to def divine a country's genuine uh, nuclear intentions at a very early stage of development. In the absence of observable indicators, like actually taking concrete steps down a pathway, um, it's really hard to know if an ally is serious about its recently announced ENR program or just bluffing for, for, for leverage. Now, this fundamental uncertainty, I think, points towards a much deeper moral hazard if an ally knows that the U.S. will buy out early ENR programs. A country with no real desire for uranium enrichment could just inaugurate a fuel enrichment plan and then trade this away as a bargaining chip uh, for nice concessions from, from Washington. But I think this type of bluff creates a unique opening for the U.S. to purchase a durable promise to forego ENR technology on the cheap. Now, of course, allies have been known to break nonproliferation promises in the past, but I think cutting an early deal still forces the ally to slow down and change its behavior. Um, and if it really is determined to move down a pathway, it's going to have to reveal its true desire uh, for some sort of nuclear capability. 
Now, finally, there's, there may be some governments, despite this logic, that may be unwilling to accept ENR constraints at all. Um, in line with other members of the non-aligned movement, Saudi Arabia has argued that a legal pledge to forego ENR uh, represents an unacceptable infringement on its national rights. Now, this sentiment is only likely to become more intense, I think, amid uh, the current groundswell of support for the nuclear ban treaty uh, among some NAM countries. As a result, um, alternative yet durable ENR restrictions to the legal constraints in the UAE and Taiwan uh, may, you know, may be some of the, the best possible outcomes we can hope for in the years ahead. So let me just summarize and wrap up. I've argued three things. One, that coercion and denial are becoming less effective towards U.S. allies. Two, incentives hold the great, greatest promise if they're offered at an early stage of technical development. And three, despite some of the risks uh, and challenges so associated with this approach, I do think it's one of the best paths to, uh, forward. If stopping the spread uh, of nuclear weapons and the underlying production technology is going to remain a key national security interest uh, for the U.S., then this strategic logic that I've laid out today, I, I think, indicates that inducement should continue to play a critical role in U.S. grand strategy. Um, indeed, I think the U.S. stands to reap considerable nonproliferation dividends from cutting these sort of quid pro quo deals and providing public goods, such as energy, security, and trade to our allies. Now, if cutting deals is our current president's true art form, hopefully this is a strategy and logic that the administration can get behind. With that, I, I really look forward to the discussion this morning. Thank you. Tristan, thank you. That was terrific. Thank you all to all the panelists. I, I enjoyed those remarks a lot and learned a lot from them. Uh, we've got about 40 minutes or just a little less for questions. We've got a couple people coming around with microphones. If you could raise hands. Uh, why don't we start with Jeff, but let me just, while we're bringing the microphone over, can I just start with just one quick question myself? I would like to just get quick reactions from the panelists because I think I have a range of opinions, but I'm just kind of curious. Do people believe that the nonproliferation treaty and other export controls is a handicap to U.S. companies operating in global markets or not? I think we have a range of, of opinions. I, I, I would just like to get a, maybe a quick run down the line and a, a sentence or two from each of you on that. I'm curious if your takes, if you don't mind. And anyone who wants to pass is welcome to do so. No. Not a barrier, yes. <laughs> In fact, an inducement, an enhancement. I, I think it depends on how it's done. And I think that there's a lot of flexibility at the margins. Yeah, I think the MPT is not. I think export controls poorly executed are. I would agree with uh, the sentiment that the MPT is definitely not uh, a barrier to business, and I think export controls are, depending on how they're executed, much more uh, of a potential barrier. But yeah, I, I think it. I think it really has set certain standards in place, and I think that should benefit business, as the ambassador laid out at the beginning of, of her remarks. Great, thank you. Uh, that's that's very clarifying. Uh, Jeff, did you have the microphone? And I'll apologize in advance for people. If I don't see you, if you have questions, please be aggressive in waving your hand and making sure I notice you. Jeff. Uh, Sam, thank you very much. Uh, Jeff Merrifield with Pillsbury Law Firm. Um, I, I spent uh, nine years regulating nuclear power plants as a regulator and nine years selling them uh, for an engineering construction company. So I, I'm going to make a couple of comments and I'll, and I'll follow up with a question. I, I think, very good panel, thank you for, for raising these issues. Um, Playing on, on, on the way you talked about it, Tristan, I, I, I sort of think about it as a carrot and stick approach. Uh, under Eisenhower and the Atomic Energy Act, we spent, you know, decades uh, incentivizing countries to adopt nuclear power. That was more the carrot approach. I think with the MPT treaty, we helped balance that out with more of a carrot and stick to try to get people in the right place. I think in 2009, when we signed the gold standard with UAE, we went to the stick and then maybe a carrot approach. And I think that has been, in my view, counterproductive. Um, since two, the last nuclear power plants the United States sold were in 2008, I think there is a tie between the establishment of the gold standard in the UAE in 2009 and that, and that function. I think we have made it very, very difficult for U.S. companies to get involved in nuclear commerce internationally because we demand countries to sign on the dotted line before we start discussions commercially, and we send a, an awful lot of folks out to try to pre-negotiate all these things before, we, before we, we, we have that commercial discussion. I think we do need to get more of a balance. Um, I think we need to get more of the commercial folks in. Obviously, I'm and I'm a big supporter of the M MPT. Folks have to ultimately sign on the dotted line before we sell it, but I think from a marketing standpoint, 
um, we're going this, the, the wrong direction. The, the second, I think, issue is I think there needs to be a recognition of folks that there are some within the anti-nuclear community who have wrapped uh, their anti-nuclear views and non-proliferation are just as happy to see us hamstrung in our ability to export nuclear technologies. Uh, the Russians and the Chinese are the ones who ultimately are benefiting from that and will continue if we don't, uh, we don't change things. Um, the last thing I, I would mention is not all hope is not lost. Even though uh, U.S. nuclear vendors, uh, and I'm speaking principally of Westinghouse and GE, haven't sold their reactors, that doesn't mean there are, that we as a country can't get our technologies and our capabilities involved with those countries. I used Ukraine as a good example. Those are, are Russian-built reactors. The U.S. is now supplying all the fuel. Uh, we're supplying uh, all of their uh, technologies for um, managing their used fuel. And we have a significant number of suppliers, including uh, data technology providers, who are assisting the Ukrainians in that program. So. I think to the extent even if Westinghouse and GE can't win, there, there's lots of opportunities uh, uh, to, do, to, to st still be involved as we should be connected with those countries. It's in our national best interest. So uh, the, the question, and I apologize for the long dialogue, but the question really goes to um, the, the first statement that I made is to what degree do you believe our insistence on the gold standard and pushing some of these issues up front uh, may have hindered our ability for commercial U.S. nuclear countries to engage uh, in international nuclear commerce. Great question. Thank you, Jeff. Anyone? Well, I'll jump in, um, and I'll be the first to admit that the gold standard as executed was dumb. Um, and it was one of, the, one of the reasons it was dumb, or one of the, the ways you know it was dumb, it was done behind closed doors without a full interagency process and a full conversation. Um, and by a couple of infelicitous statements uh, by, by people who, who should have known better. That being said, the, the gold standard was killed in 2012, definitively, and it has not been applied to anything other than countries who are implicated by the non-compete clause in the 123 agreement with the UAE. We signed an agreement with Vietnam that, had no, that was not a gold standard. Uh, agreement. Um, it did not have legally binding constraints on ENR. It had politically binding constraints, and, and Vietnam was happy to make those, frankly. There was not, that was not a matter of debate. And so starting in 2012 was the quote-unquote uh, tailored approach, principled tailored approach, in which a judgment was made about the, the capabilities and the intent of each country and, a, and an approach to the ENR management question that was uh, specific to that. Um, the, the Saudi and the Jordanian uh, discussions are constrained not by a gold standard policy, but by the terms of the UAE agreement. And so I think we have to be really careful about uh, saying what the problem is. Uh, I have not heard from U.S. Uh, companies where they would like to do business apart from Saudi and, and Jordan, and those are, those are fraught and complex, uh, where, they do, where they currently lack a one, two, three agreement, um, and where, where a, uh, delays in one, two, three agreements are preventing commerce. We used to have briefings from the Commerce Department coming in from Syntac uh, every time we would have a discussion about one, two, three agreements. And we, I'm not aware that there was ever an instance in which there was a serious U.S. corporate interest in working in a country that, uh, where we decided against or where there was a delay in, in, a, in a one, two, three agreement, but maybe folks in the room can, can clarify that. Um, so I think the, there's a lot to, cr to criticize um, about how the 123 agreement came about, and, or the, the gold standard came about. And, but I don't think we need to exaggerate, and I don't think it helps U.S. industry to exaggerate uh, the, the nature of its application. We have yet to see how the Trump administration is going to approach this issue. As far as I'm aware, there's not a 123 issue that's come forward uh, since this administration started. Maybe others know about that. So I think it's an open question uh, about how they're going to approach it. Jeff, I, I would just say I think there's a gold standard shadow. I mean, I think that, that Laura just explained why it's not, I don't know if it's dead, but it, it certainly has been, been overtaken by the subsequent agreements. But I do think there's a perception that somehow um, that, that this is a lingering shadow on, on U.S. commerce. But that being said, if I'm reading into, trying at least to read into to what it is that you said, I think there's a real, real concern about what the real intention is in the Middle East among some of these countries that are interested in this technology. You know, and it's hard to divorce that reading of intentions from what's happening in, in Iran. So I, you know, I'm not 
suggesting that um, that the gold standard has impeded uh, these agreements. So I think your your historical analysis of 2008 versus 2009 is kind of hard to argue with. Uh, but you know, I, I I think we don't want an arms race in the Middle East. I think that's a strategic strategically not in the interest of the United States. And so how you manage that as these countries pursue this technology, I think is important and it's gonna be nuanced and I don't think you can do it with the hammer of the, of, of the gold standard. I wish you would quit calling it the gold standard because um, it ain't and um, as long as we do, people who aren't maybe in this room are gonna consider it as a gold standard, which it's not. Yeah, if I, if, I, if I didn't make this clear in, in my remarks, I don't think the gold standard is necessary, nor is it feasible. Uh, I think there's special reasons why we were able to conclude those agreements with the UAE and Taiwan. Just look at the amount of asymmetric leverage in that alliance relationship with Taiwan, for example. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm making the case that there's a number of alternative mechanisms that, that we, we, we can pursue uh, to get that sort of binding pledge, but it, it need not be uh, what, what we have with those two countries. Um, you know, and to get back to a point that Ken made in this presentation, you know, if, if countries are not relying on U.S. supply and they're developing technology indigenously or they're acquiring it from other suppliers, uh, they're not going to be bound by any of these, any of these restrictions whatsoever. Uh, and there is a very clear uh, room to operate within both Articles 2 and 4 of the NPT uh, to build up um, a, a, an above-board civil nuclear energy program that can be easily flipped, um, you know, if a decision is ever made. So I think we need to we need to think seriously about what's practical rather than what's you know most desirable in terms of something like a gold a gold standard agreement. Terrific. Other questions? Maybe just go down the line. Is that Matt there? Or? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll direct this question to Tristan, but open it to other folks too. You mentioned uh, you could elaborate more on hand tying mechanisms uh, when you were talking. So I was wondering if you could give some kind of list of these hand tying mechanisms, and also maybe a list of incentives in, in your mind that you know uh, are at the forefront for offering to other countries, and maybe in exchange for these hand tying uh, mechanisms. And then finally, um, as a specific test case. Do you have in mind a sort of set of both that might work in the case of Saudi Arabia? Thanks for asking me a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me just say, and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying this to deflect attention, but I'd be happy to, to email you a couple of really in-depth articles that I've written on this topic, uh, and we can kind of go through uh, specifics. Let me, let me just kind of give a couple of broad uh, uh, examples. Um, so let me start with Saudi Arabia just to make it concrete so we don't kind of get off in, 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 in some abstract uh, you know, logic land. Um, so with Saudi Arabia, I think there was really good reasons to brush off uh, the threat to start an enrichment program in 2015. Um, I think there's been few signs, especially at the time that they were serious uh, about actually going down that route. Um, but they're starting to lay the foundation today with the skills and training acquisition program. Um, there's a longer term goal of trying to build up kind of a latent capability uh, by the time that some, maybe some of the physical constraints on the JCPOA expire in 10 or 15 years. Um, so I think Washington might find itself with less leverage um, in the years ahead to rebuff demands if Saudi returns to the table again. They've developed something either indigenously or they've turned to alternative supply options that are outside of the NSG. And here I think you could, you could think of uh, the old Saudi-Pakistan connection, but not in terms of the Pakistanis giving the Saudis some sort of, you know, uh, fizzle material or weapon, but rather uh, the Pakistanis saying, hey, we're willing to uh, cut some sort of above-board deal to supply you with, with what you need. Now, obviously, Pakistan's technology is not the greatest, uh, but that is an alternative option. Um, I think uh, in terms of specific things that we could ask for from, from Saudi Arabia, um, we already provide significant arms and defense support, obviously. Um, I think if Saudi Arabia decides to seriously pursue nuclear energy, and, and there's been recent indicators um, that, that they are going down that path, um, I think they, could, they may be willing to accept a Vietnam model uh, ENR restriction that Ambassador Holgate mentioned. He called this kind of the silver standard, but I still think it's perfectly adequate. Um, For some, Vietnam. Hmm? For Vietnam. It was tailored. It's not a standard. 
Yes. Yeah, so, so a Vietnam uh, a Vietnam model, you know, so something in that in that in which it's you know it could be in the preamble to the 123. Uh, it's it's not a legal forfeiture, as I mentioned in my in my, in my remarks. Um, and they might accept that to ensure the continuity of U.S. Uh, defense assistance going forward. Um, uh, and there's another, and this, this gets to, um, to Jack's point, there's another inducement that could prove attractive uh, if the Saudis get serious about nuclear energy, and that's a complete package of nuclear fuel cycle services for nuclear reactors, including a guarantee to manage all spent fuel and nuclear waste. Now, obviously, that would require us to uh, get our own house in order, uh, but I think that is something, you know, spent, spent waste, Management is a serious issue, not just for Saudi Arabia, but for a number of other countries. I think that's that's a that's a major incentive if we figured out how to how to crack that nut that we could provide. Can I can I just add something? I just reject the idea that if Saudi Arabia wants to build a nuclear weapon or build enrichment capacity, that they're not going to do so because of some stick or some carrot. The best we can do is help manage that for some period of time. But even then, if they're doing that in response to Iran, they're doing that in re response to Iran, and that's the bottom line. That's why I come back to these are foreign policy issues, and that what all of these things do are give us tools and authority to act. The problem is not that we're not, that we don't see these things happening, and not that we don't have the authority, but we often don't have, we're not, com we're, we just don't do it, or we, we, we do something other than preventing those actors who we don't want to get the nuclear capability from getting the nuclear capability. And so that's just, I think that's the bottom line. We need to, we need to promote democracy and promote free markets. That's how you crack this nut, not by giving them some incentive. I, I just want to follow, I, I agree with 99.9% .9 of what you're I'll take that. <laughs> No. Now just if everyone else would. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I ratcheted back to 99.7 percent. <laughs> I, I I think this is a I think this the Saudi Arabia I think is a really good example of are we really thinking strategically, or are we thinking inside our silos? This this is a country that is looking at the end of the JCPOA and saying how am I going to be positioned for the end of this temporary blockade on the Iranian program, okay? I think to talk about Saudi in the context of just 123 or, or ju you know, just nuclear commerce or whatever, I mean, this is a much, much bigger issue than, than, than just the, the transfer of, of technology. And it strikes me that not just the current political climate that we live in, but the political climate we've been living in for the last, what's this, 2017, for the last 17, roughly 17 years, is we're not thinking about this strategically, and we devolve it down to the bureaucratic kind of box level, and I think that's a huge mistake. I think Jack is exactly right. This is a big foreign policy issue, and it has serious implications beyond 2020 and 2025 that you need to be giving consideration to now and not just you know, kind of nitpicking about whether or not the JCPOA is good or bad, or this needs to be improved or that needs to be improved. It's going to stick until probably the end, but at the end, we might have a major problem. And what happens in that intervening period, I think, is quite important. And that intervening period just happens to be right now. <laughs> I just want to add one thing about Prince Turkey. He is the designated like canary in the coal mine. When, when Saudi feels nervous, they send Prince Turkey out to talk nuclear. They know that's what gets our attention, and then we flow the inducements. I, it, it is he, When Prince Turkey says, we're going to go for enrichment, what he really says is, we need a hug. And he doesn't care what kind of hug they get, but it's a foreign policy hug. It's not a nuclear hug that he's looking for. And Because we can give him a nuclear hug. We can provide uh, front-end fuel, you know, fuel assurances. We can support you know, at least uh, dry cast storage. Um, I mean, there's, he doesn't need a nuclear hug. They need an alliance hug. And so it's, re it's normal and reasonable that we respond with alliance uh, consequences in the terms of arms sales and, and, uh, and other connection points. So I think we just really have to be careful about how literally we take some of these statements. Great conversation. Uh, Richard, now the end, or? Oh. Rich Kosleridge from George Mason University, and sorry to move off the foreign policy uh, side, but Ken, I was struck by a couple of points that you made uh -oh. uh, in terms of recognizing the new realities and cyber and, and AI and non-state actors and, and the need for 
uh, nuclear security to get beyond the guns, uh, gates, and guards approach. And as you were talking about that, I got to thinking about the vulnerabilities in our electrical grid overall, and that if, in a sense, some of these same challenges apply to that, uh, how much of a back door is there, even if you do everything that you would like to do for nuclear security of, of our power generation system, if, if there's a way of people infiltrating via the grid into the, into the system as well? Yeah, I mean, that's beyond my technical capacity to really to really answer that question. I, I, you know, when I don't know the answer, I tend to fall back on, on anecdotal information that people provide to me, which is the sheer number of attacks on the, on the, um, on the uh, infrastructure of the United States is shocking. You know, I mean, it's not a couple a day. It's hundreds or thousands a day from lots of different places. So, you know, I... I, I have to say, I just to devolve for, for one second, we have built a digital infrastructure on, on sand. I mean, you know, Equifax and, and all of these, I mean, you've got to be kidding me. We cannot be reliant on a structure that is this vulnerable. And so the private sector companies that are doing this have a real corporate responsibility to the citizens to do better. And whether the Congress can mandate that, which I doubt, or whether the White House can mandate that, which I doubt, you know, I think that this is critical to their business model um, because people are losing faith in the capability of, these, of this digital environment that we live in to protect their information and their interests. Can I just uh, give a slightly different perspective? I don't think that they have a responsibility to the citizens. Um, that's not, I don't want my corporations being responsible to my citizens. That's a, I, I like to keep them apart. Who they have a responsibility to are to their shareholders. And when an Equifax does what Equifax does, no one wants that junk anymore. So I think the market works this stuff out. As long as you have the incentives properly aligned, I think that, um, you know, we protect our own networks. And I think you see that in w whenever there are these breaches. So it's not about citizens, it's about shareholders and, and well, profits. citizens do, Jack. Sam, can I, <laughs> Sam, they are. Can, I, can I jump in on this? Because I, I think there's an important, just, just so it's not lost. So uh, recognizing all the concerns on, on cyber, which I think are, are, are quite legitimate, and, and I agree with you, you know, our electri you know, our electrical grid is subject to significant attacks each and every day. But I want to step back for a second and look at the law and regulation. Um, there is, under law right now and under regulation, a requirement that FERC have responsibility through a variety of structures on, on ensuring the grid. Uh, and there is a lot of investment in, in regulations are being dealt with in, in that particular regard. As it relates to new civilian nuclear power plants in the United States, it is the responsibility of the NRC to regulate cybersecurity at those plants. Um, now, there was a period, and I would go back to you know, 2001 when we had the calendar switch, and a lot of computer pr problems, there, there, was there was probably more attention put to nu civilian nuclear power plants than any other part of our infrastructure, and, and they sailed through. There are a significant number of elements in the design of those systems at those plants which make them more resilient to the kind of attacks from the Internet that we have elsewhere. Not to say it's not something we need to continue to look at each and every day, but there is a significant regulatory footprint that the NRC commissioners and their security staff have put in defending U.S. nuclear power plants against this, the kind of cyber threats that we're seeing elsewhere. So do we need to re remain vigilant? Yes. But I just want to, in the context of this meeting, didn't want to leave people with the impression that the U.S. utilities were, were the next Equifax. That is quite no. contrary. No. And, and, and there's a robust defense. So yeah, we need to re remain vigilant. Yes, we need to continue to do the things necessary to prevent that. But that is one area of the infrastructure which has received significant attention from regulators, from policymakers, and from the utilities themselves. I, I'm glad you clarified that. That, was, that wasn't really my point, Jeff. But, but there are other countries where the regulatory mm -hmm. footprint is not quite, and the yes. reputational disaster is a wave that travels across borders, as you saw in Fukushima. Great. Other questions right over here? 
It's just actually a short comment. I do like the term that South Korea is confused. Um, when the new administration came in, uh, it was all about anti-nuclear. It was administration that were confused. I don't think it was a public that had any uh, concern. They were all going nuclear. Then just yesterday, the government announced they will no longer use term anti-nuclear in his administration. So basically, he's confusing now citizens. So what is this policy, it's anti-nuclear or non-anti-nuclear? But they, uh, he did announce that uh, our administration is not using the term anti-nuclear. Instead, I don't know how to translate, but it's something about new energy policy or some sort. So it's getting more uh, moving forward or toward a little more warming up to being a little more nuclear. But because he was elected with a very strong support from environmentalists and civic groups, he has to stand. But he's sort of uh, neutralizing his point of view. Now he's confused. Or his administration is confused. And now Korean public and citizen confused because they don't know which direction it's going. So the term confused is still there. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Paul? Yeah. Nobody else said. Um, <coughs> you know, I, I have a question about, uh, I guess I would call it the, the standards. And uh, I'm not a real non proliferation expert myself. I try to, to follow it, but, but certainly don't consider myself an expert. I, I had an impression in the past. Uh, that there was, uh, let's call it, a, an aspiration to develop tighter and tighter universally agreed global standards, uh, which uh, to me seems like it has not really succeeded. And Ambassador Holgate, when you talk about the, the model you were talking about of a virtuous circle, it sounds to me a little bit like a response to the, the failure of that other approach, which I would view as kind of a, co a top-down, government-driven approach. And I, I, what you're describing sounds more to me like a bottom-up uh, type uh, uh, approach per to, to perhaps the similar, the, the same problem. Uh, <clears throat> but when I look at the problem globally, and you know, I follow Russia fairly closely. Uh, Russia tends to view most U.S. and broader Western efforts to establish uh, standards in areas like this uh, as standards to improve the competitiveness of our uh, companies, you know, whether it's in arms or you know, some other area, uh, at, at the expense of, of theirs. Uh, and it, it seems to me like almost no matter what approach you take to trying to have tighter global standards, uh, uh, we, we may well run into that same problem in much the same way, actually, that Jack was talking about, you know, the, the fundamental problem not being uh, 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 the rules, but that there are certain people who are just going to break the rules. Uh, no matter what, because they're determined to achieve a particular outcome. And I'd be very interested in your, your reaction to that. Well, I'm sure others will have reactions, but I'll take a stab. First of all, we have to be clear about what standards we're talking about. Um, there are standards about don't let nuclear, civilian nuclear technology support weapons. That's a set of standards. They're mainly manifested in things like safeguards agreements um, and to a certain degree in export control. Um, there are standards about don't let your nuclear infrastructure hurt people. So those are safety standards. Those are manifested in national regulations and in global treaties. Um, and then there are standards about don't let bad guys steal the stuff that you can use to make bombs. And that's the part that Ken very appropriately identified as being the least uh, globally applicable. There's national standards around that, ideally, um, and there's there's international, there's, there is a treaty, the Convention on Physical Protection, that is binding on about 100 countries uh, who have accepted that in, in its most uh, uh, intrusive form. But there's no verification 
uh, of, of any of these safety standards or, or uh, security standards at the global level. So first of all, we have to unpack what the standards mean. Um, I think for some of these standards, they, we do, we should be understanding them as, as absolute. I mean, Russia, we should want safety standards that are, you know, as, as high as they can reasonably and effectively be. And we ought to want Russia to live up to those. But when it comes to sales, you're talking about two sides of that coin. One, you're, one is you're talking about who's offering it. And obviously Russia wants to be as low price as possible, but you're also uh, talking about the buyer. And that's where we can really operate and saying you want to protect your people. You want to protect your environment. You want to protect your, the, the economic um, liability <laughs> of your companies uh, who may be Im implicated if you buy a, a, a not safe or a less safe facility. And so I, at some level I kind of give up on trying to affect Russia mentality on this and it's really about how can we use the global governance process and the norm setting process to influence those to whom Russia wishes to sell. Uh, there's a limit to how much the U.S. can affect what happens inside Russia's own territory with its own reactors that builds on its own territory. Although, as Ken has pointed out, we will suffer if they have problems there. And, you know, see Chernobyl. Um, the, um, so there are, there are still connection points, but our connection, our, our ability to affect that is smaller. What we can affect is when Russia does things that are outside of the realm of what we wish they would do, that that is highlighted. And the nuclear suppliers group, when it comes to technology transfer, is one tool by which we can, you know, there's nothing binding there, but when someone acts out, we can say, you're acting out. Um, and that's, that has one effect, not necessarily on Russian behavior, but on the behavior to, of those to whom Russia would wish to sell. And so I think that's what we really need to be advocating the standards, to whichever chunk of standards it is you're talking about, it's, it's on the buyer side. I, I would say, Paul, that it's not a matter of standards versus bad actors. I mean, I think Jack is 100% right. If you're a bad actor and your intent is to have a nuclear weapons program, all the standards in the world are not because it's just paper, you know, you'll, you'll just walk, they'll just walk right past it. But I do think, so I forget who it was, but somebody made, a, I think, a really interesting point I hadn't thought about, which is that beyond DPRK and Iran, at the moment, there are, I think maybe Laura made this point, no more immediate threats on the horizon. So to the degree that you have Iran bottled up at the moment and, and North Korea not bottled up at the moment, um, there, there, are no, uh, there are no new threats. So there is an opportunity at this particular point in history to think about how you would improve the regime and whether or not standards for going forward could be, um, could be better. But I, I would say that when you come to the two major impediments to that thinking, Russia, I just don't think there's any way to influence the Russians at this point. I just think for, for all of the good qualities of the Russian nation, it's just, I don't see how you're going. If we say the sky, you know, if we say it's six, they say, no, it's a half a dozen. You know, it's just, it doesn't matter. And somebody had a great quote the other day, you know, but if I said six and the president said half a dozen, you guys would make an issue out of it. That's kind of like what the Russians are. <laughs> you know, it, it, it does, that he said it about the press. You know, I think it was Mattis. Mattis said, if I said six and the president said half a dozen, you guys would make an issue about it. But I think that's what it's like with the Russians. Whatever we say, the Russians are going to say the opposite. China, however, I think is a different story. I think China is a different story. And I think of China, because it's got a stronger economy and I think it's a little bit more sophisticated and less vindictive in its thinking, um, could become a potential, I wouldn't say ally, but I would say, you know, kind of compatriot in trying to improve the overall system. There is no business value in having nuclear accidents or nuclear terrorism, period. That is, that should be the starting point, okay? So taking risks along those two lines, I think, are a big mistake, and I think if the Chinese want to be in this business for the long term, then probably they're going to see the value in that. The Russians- But, but risk is really subjective, right? I mean, and it's a gradation. It is, but the, let's just think about where some of these reactors might be going. I mean, let's just look at a country, let's say Indonesia or Vietnam. These are not well-known nuclear um, deep infrastructure, excuse me, deep infrastructure nations. Look at UAE. That is not a deep infrastructure nation, but they bought it and imported it all, and I'm very happy that they did, and I hope that they continue to do that, as well as developing their own indigenous capability. So, you know, there, there is, but there is, there is risk when you decide to take on clients that can't manage the technologically 
effectively, and that's why the Russian model of build own operate works for countries like that, because their people, their people will do it. But the Chinese, I don't know, have the depth to build own operate. Um, and if they want to export, they might be more amenable to, you know, to a system that that's, has standards that are higher. Just two quick things. I think that often when we talk about these, we almost act as if people from other countries care less about safety. And that's just not true. They want a safe reactor as much as the rest of us do. Um, and that companies who build reactors care less about safety. And I, I just, I reject all that. I think that everyone wants safe nuclear power. And that when they make that jump to spend billions of dollars to build a reactor, they don't want it melting down. I prefer not to focus on standards. I think the more important part is markets. I think a properly structured market incentivizes high standards. The problem with focusing too much on standards, especially codified standards, is that you begin designing toward the standards. Then that becomes a barrier to, innovative, uh, to innovation. And you see that all across the board in heavily regulated sectors. So markets are what ultimately matters. Standards will follow the markets. If you, fo if you focus on standards, I think you don't get what, where you actually want to be. Sure. Uh, we're approaching the top of the hour, but last question. Okay. Esoteric question here. Uh, speaking of the future, and uh, thanks for pulling together this panel, very esteemed and loquacious panel. Uh, I've agreed with about 60. Did we talk too much? No, I didn't say that. Well, she understood. <laughs> Uh, I agree with about 67% of what they said, but nonetheless, it was a great discussion. But on the uh, David Blee U.S. Nuclear Infrastructure Council, you started out by talking about innovation, and we absolutely agree with you that innovation is the key to changing the economics, the supply chain, exports, uh, share, financing, regulatory reform, you can drive that, safety, you know, passive safety, the, the change in the fuel cycle. Uh, and certainly American leadership. So given all that, here's my question for the panels. It says, has, we've got some experts here on nonproliferation. Is do you think smaller innovative reactors, or maybe more innovative reactors, how does it affect, the, how, do you think that could be a game changer for nonproliferation, for you know, one, two, threes, for export controls, for all of that, or you think it makes it more difficult because now you're talking about non-light water reactor, you're talking about closed fuel cycle and other things. So how do, you, how do you, in terms of innovation respective to your areas of expertise in particular, how do you see that? It depends. <laughs> um, it depends on... You can be loquacious, come on. It, de <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the, fuel, the, the specific reactor technology. It depends on the fuel cycle associated with that. It depends on the degree to which, uh, and alongside safety by design and cost by design, also, security and safeguards are incorporated at the design level as opposed to being bolted on, which has been why those have been so expensive in Gen 3, as they were invented after the Gen 3 reactors uh, were largely deployed. Um, so I, it, it can't, properly done, it can and it should promote U.S. technology uh, presence and all of the attendant s commercial and national security benefits from that. Poorly done, it could make it worse. But not a panacea. Not a panacea, but we have the we have time to get it right, and now is the time. I, I agree with what Lauren said. I think we're at the at the design stage, and the design stage is when you want to build in your defense system and uh, these reactors. This is not new technology. These are all <laughs> pre-existing technologies put in a smaller package, okay? Which has maybe its own issues and how it's sited underground, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I, I think there's time to look at this in depth. We're going to do it over the next year. Um, I know others are going to look at it over the next year. This is a, a, a set of reactors where the U.S. could have a competitive advantage, and I would like to see them have a competitive advantage, but it, it can't, you can't be exporting many bomb factories. Well, but and again, given your fact that more than America can be involved in nuclear energy in the world, and this drives that, that at least that part helps. It does. I would like to see the federal government put some more resources into into the non-light water field because the private sector is not going to assume all the risk on this. Things like loan guarantees and R&D. Maybe even real money. 
<laughs> That's the point seven percent. Never Jack. <laughs> I'm going to Blee, protect my neck from Jack. <laughs> Blee, you literally asked that question specifically with me not to answer. You said you two. I can. <laughs> okay, you. So, so look, I, I I don't look at the current fleet as this big non this big proliferation threat. I think that like we've talked about. States matter. The technology doesn't necessarily matter. If you run a light water reactor on a six-month fuel cycle, you're going to get more plutonium, and you know that's what they're doing to build weapons. If you're, if you're not, then you, you're, then you're not. So, like, I don't see that as the threat. What I care about is the economics. That's where I think the SMRs and the Gen 4 and all of these things matter, because that's what ultimately will carry the day. Um, now, you can't I agree, you can't build a mini bomb factory, but assuming it's not a mini bomb factory and it's economical, that's where you get the game changer. And that's why I don't support the government involvement, because I think the government involvement makes the economics long term the economic long term outlook less promising. But that's probably for a different panel. <laughs> we are just past the top of the hour now, so why don't we leave it there? Thank you to all the panelists for terrific remarks. <laughs> Thank you for organizing. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much for coming. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Thank you very much. Very good.